You know, that's all part of our sexuality. And I think when we only define it as find a spouse, get married and have sex, we're limiting the full scope of what it means to be sexual people. Today we're, we're talking with Dr. Julie Slattery, who's the founder of Authentic Intimacy, um, psychologist, written lots of books about sex and intimacy. And um, our goal today is just to talk through some issues that um, we hope will encourage and challenge some of you. Why do you think it's important for us in the church to talk about intimacy? Well, I think, first of all, because, uh, because the world's talking about it so much. And because the church has been quiet about it, essentially, we've learned to think about sexuality from more of a cultural perspective. Yeah, I like to think about it in terms of what's your sexual narrative? What is the story, the backstory of your sexuality that helps you make sense of everything you experience? And the culture has given us a very loud and compelling narrative that helps us understand our sexuality as being part of our identity. And we need to have free expression to find happiness. Uh, the church has been silent or giving a, given us a very simplistic narrative of just save sex for marriage. And that's pretty much mm -hmm. it. And so I really think it's important for the church to step in and to uh, give us a truly biblical narrative of why does God even care about this area of my life? Why are there so many rules in the Bible about sex? And how does that apply to the real struggles that I'm experiencing? And we haven't done that. And so because we haven't done it, I think most Christians, even if they believe in God and read their Bibles, they think about sex from a cultural perspective instead of from a biblical perspective. So what are those misconceptions that you see um, in the church of a cultural perspective instead of a <laughs> biblical perspective? Well, I think in the church, you know, part of it is we don't know how to talk about sexuality apart from marriage. Uh, we don't know how to talk about sexuality apart from sex. And in reality, our sexuality is a lot more than what we're doing with our bodies. And so when you go to church and all you hear is God wants you to save sex for marriage, you get the message that God wants me not to be a sexual person unless I'm married. And that's very confusing because everybody's sexual. We have desires, we have longings, we have thoughts and feelings. And if there's no context for how to understand those and steward those well, then people just feel like the only option I have is to shut down this aspect of who I am. And the culture is saying, no, don't shut it down. That's the worst thing you can do. So I think a lot of Christians are really confused about that. Uh, and then also, I think uh, the church gives a lot of mixed messages. Like if you're single, they're telling you to exercise all this self-control to shut down sexually. But then there's no guidance for even married couples in terms of what is it now? Is it just a free-for-all? What about sexual brokenness in marriage? Is it possible to be engaging with sex with your spouse but it's lustful and it's selfish. Uh, and so there's no sense of what does it mean to mature in this area of my life? Uh, so there's a lot of missing pieces. And I think those also get to applied to the cultural conversations we have from the church. Like we don't know how to talk about LGBTQ. We don't know how to talk about pornography, sexual abuse, the Me Too movement. So we just stay quiet because we don't know what to say. Yeah, you, you touched on so much there that we want to talk about, so that's excellent. Um, first, can you talk a little bit, I've heard you talk some about uh, purity, the purity movement, the teachings yes. of purity, the almost obsession with purity, which makes us obsessed with sex and not doing it, and then yeah. all the stuff that that leads to. What, do you, what are your impressions of that? Where does it come short for those of us who grew up in it, which is most of us? <laughs> yeah, you know, I think uh, the purity narrative presents – this either or dichotomy. So either you are pure or you're not. And really presents like, if you want to be a good Christian, the greatest thing you can do is be sexually pure. But what does that mean in real life? Uh, when I think about friends I have, for example, that grew up in very different circumstances than I did, maybe not Christian families, maybe they experienced all kinds of trauma in their past. And then they act out sexually, which is completely understandable when you understand somebody's background. And then they go to church and the first thing they hear is you're not sexually pure, but this Christian over here is because she never had sex outside of marriage. 
that is an isolating message. And really what you have is you have people that feel a tremendous amount of shame related to their sexuality. And then you've got another camp of people that feel very self-righteous and feel like, wow, the world is broken. I'm here to rescue them. And that's not consistent with the message of Jesus, that we're all broken. None of us are pure. And yes, we may have stewarded our sexuality differently, largely based on background and maybe the help of God and the help of wise parents. But, you know, even if you save sex for marriage, there's aspects of your sexuality that are are probably very broken. And there's ways that you've stewarded that sexuality that isn't part of God's design. And so I think it's way more healthy to talk about things like sexual integrity or maturity. You know, am I surrendering everything that I am to the Lordship of Christ? And that's an ongoing journey. Uh, So I think that's part of it. And then like I shared earlier, the purity message gives you no context for what it looks like to steward your sexuality within marriage. Um, So those are a few of the limitations I could go on and talk about a lot more, but those are, <laughs> those are some of them that come to mind. Um, so you also brought up the singleness of suppressing that sexuality. So <laughs> what are your thoughts on how do single people embrace the sexuality that God has given them in a really healthy and biblical way? Yeah. Yeah. Good question. And it starts with understanding, like I said, that your sexuality isn't just whether or not you're having sex. When we awaken, even in puberty, you know, the hormones, the longings, the drives that start to awaken are about telling you, it's your body telling you that you were not made to do life alone. Hmm. Uh, Like God said in the very beginning, it wasn't good for man to be alone and it's still not good for a man to be alone or a woman. Now, does that mean that all of us are going to end up married? Not all of us are. Uh, The majority of people will end up getting married and their sexual desire and longings to share their life and their body with somebody is going to propel them to pursue an intimate relationship. That's God's design. It it awakens something that says, I don't want to do life alone. Like I'm lonely. I want people, I want somebody to share my life with. Uh, But even outside of marriage, those same longings cause us to pursue community. They cause us to, in friendship, share vulnerably uh, because we have a a desire to be known and accepted and loved. Uh, We have a desire to, in a very healthy way, be hugged and touched. Uh, You know, that's all part of our sexuality. And I think when we only define it as find a spouse, get married and have sex, we're limiting the full scope of what it means to be sexual people. To be sexual means to need relationship, to need intimacy, uh, to need connection. And so there's lots of ways that we pursue those things outside of just having sex with somebody. So single people have a purpose and uh, a purpose in their sexuality. They aren't, they aren't deprived of sexuality. There's still purpose for them within that. Yes, absolutely. Their sexuality ultimately is a physical way that we experience a spiritual truth. And so when you read the whole scripture, you consistently see sex and sexuality and marriage as a metaphor of God's pursuit, his passion, his faithfulness, his love for his people. And so within our sexuality is this physical experience that helps us understand the heart of God. You know, the same way that scripture would say, you've experienced physical hunger, you know what it is to be hungry. So now I want you to be hungry for righteousness. Jesus is the bread of life. Let's be hungry for him. You know, Jesus said, my food is to do the will of my father. That satisfies me. So the physical helps us understand the spiritual. And in the same way, for both the single and married person, sexual longing and desire isn't supposed to end with another person. You know, the scripture tells us that the end of time is going to be this wedding feast of Christ and his bridegroom, and that there's going to be a unity that actually put sex to shame. You know, sex is just a foreshadow. Our longings are a foreshadow of what we were really created for, and that's ultimate unity with God. So there's there's a more mystical, metaphorical purpose behind our sexuality that we see continually referred to in the scripture. And so I think for both married and single Christians, we have to be mindful that marriage is the metaphor of the fulfillment, but not the fulfillment in and of itself. 
what does sexual wholeness, sexual health for all humans look like? Not just married couples, but as individuals, yeah. whether we're single or teenager or 85 and widowed. Yeah. Sexual wholeness looks like I understand that God made me a sexual person because I was not made to do life alone. And first of all, that applies to my relationships here on earth. I want to be known as a loving person, as a passionate person, as somebody who in the right context is unguarded and authentic. You know, that again, we think always about sex instead of about the character, the humanity that goes behind the beauty of sexuality, which is um, to be an open person, to be a loving, a, a giving person who also knows how to receive. And within marriage, that plays out in a very physical, tangible way. But for all of us, we're called to have that, that personality, that, that presence about us. Um, and then in terms of the spiritual aspect of it, I was not made to do life alone without God. And so everything that sex and sexuality represents it's a physical way of experiencing what God is really ultimately calling us to. You think about, you know, God's love, like marriage and sex, is passionate. And so I want my worship with God to be passionate, a passionate expression of the covenant that I have with Him. God's love is faithful. Uh, and He calls us as married couples to be faithful because it's a metaphor of the way He calls us to be faithful to Him. We see that over and over again in Scripture. So I want that to be part of my relationships here on earth and with God. And then third of all, when we look at God's love and his commitment, it's sacrificial. And, you know, I think that's part of our sexuality and part of sex within marriage. It's not all about what I can get. It's about God making me somebody that wants to give. And, uh, and again, that's very tangible in the marriage relationship related to sex but we're all called to be that way with one another. And so yeah, I think there's such practical application of this that we miss when we only talk about what happens with our bodies. Yeah. yeah. Can you share um, where to find you? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So uh, my ministry is called Authentic Intimacy and you can find it at AuthenticIntimacy.com. Great way to jump in is we have a podcast called Java with Julie. And uh, we're just talking actually in a coffee shop about these issues every week and just fleshing them out for real life. But there's all kinds of book studies and uh, videos and things like that at that website that might be helpful as well. Great. AuthenticIntimacy.com. That's it. I love Preston's work because I think he's doing a great job of walking that razor thin edge mm -hmm. of loving, being grace filled without compromising truth. Yeah. Um, you know, he's, he's, he's doing a great job with that tension and we need his voice. Yeah.